Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. which I always like to say the old J.P. Morgan, because 
because it was a firm that um, Chris and I, it was a very different firm than the JP Morgan today. I don't mean that to be insulting to anyone who's maybe working at JP Morgan today, but it was a uh, much smaller and, and incredibly um, uh, strong culture and highly ethical place. And uh, I left after the merger with Chase. I sort of hung around for a little while. I went to meet my new boss. Um, I, was, I was doing, we were doing venture investing out of what was called Lab Morgan at the time. And we were then going to report into Chase Capital Partners, which was this big gorilla private equity firm. So I went to meet the big guy up on the big floor. And he was very friendly. He was all lovely. And he was telling me how great this was going to be, and a bigger platform, and all stuff. And I literally, in the elevator, I was feeling sick. I could tell I was getting fever. And in the elevator on the way down, I literally passed out and, and woke up on the floor of the elevator on the ground floor um, on this office building on 6th Avenue. And so that kind of gave me a hint that maybe it was <laughs> um, But anyway, I, I, left, um, I left Morgan in, uh, I don't know, April, May of 2001. And, you know, it was really just, I, I just knew that that culture wasn't for me, and I had been restless for a while. And so I just decided to take some time off, take the summer off. And, um, and it turned out to be quite a summer. Um, first thing I did, some friends of mine um, had, a, um, had a desire to sail to England to participate in the 150th anniversary of the America's Cup. And there's this big shindig in Cowes, England. And so they bought a 50-foot sailboat and uh, it was designed to you know, do ocean sailboat. And uh, there were two of them, and they were going to bring some of their kids, and they needed another adult uh, on the trip. And I had just quit my job, so I didn't have any excuses to say no. So anyway, they invited me to go. And I, I'm a laser sailor, right? I mean, I don't do, I don't do ocean. And um, but I figured, what the heck, this would be interesting. When else are going to do it? And I did a little research, and basically, because uh, we had three young kids at home, and, and Sue, my wife, was here, um, my, my college sweetheart, uh, <laughs> uh, gave me permission when I explained it. The real danger if you have a good boat and know what you're doing and are not going during hurricane season is uh, two things. One, you might get hit by a whale. And two, uh, there are these containers that slide off the big ships and they submerge, but they don't sink because they get air pocket. So, that's, you know, if you hit one of those, you can kind of ruin your day. So, <laughs> off we go. And, um, excuse me, I'm having a Marco Rubio, a Marco Rubio. Rubio moment. <laughs> So anyway, off we go, and, and a thousand miles out, while I was sleeping, just for the record, uh, we slammed into what seemed like a rock. And um, it turns out a humpback whale had come on underneath the boat and torpedoed into the, into the rudder and pushed it up into the hull, shattered the rudder, so it was like in two pieces floating on the other side of the boat. And I'm sure there's some sailors in the audience, you know what happens when your rudder is shattered on two sides of the boat. And you're going, it's going 20 knots, and you get all the sails up. You start going around in circles, uh, flying jobs out of control. And so, to make a long story short, we ended up flying around on the ocean all day and ended up getting towed back to Newfoundland by the Canadian Coast Guard. And uh, it was my 30 seconds of fame because whales are a big deal in Newfoundland. And so, we were on the local news and in the bar. And so, it was, it was, so, that was the first thing that happened on my summer vacation. And then uh, the first day I I, um, and this is not getting to the, to the talk. The first day that um, I actually put a suit on and went back to the city to start thinking about what I was going to do with the rest of my life, uh, I had a meeting um, downtown. I had worked downtown. I hadn't been downtown since. And I had a meeting downtown with a guy who was running a charter school company. And I had, um, I had already begun thinking about aligning capital with social and environmental purposes. I had actually invest, invested in Edison Schools, uh, one of the early charter school companies. When I'm still worrying. So I had this meeting with this guy to talk about you know, what was happening in the space. And uh, the meeting was at 9.30. And so I'd taken the subway down, and, and, um, and at about 9.10 at City Hall, this guy walked in the subway, and he was closer to me than you are, and he announced they just flew a plane into the trade center. And so I went to the street, and I got to the street right after the second plane had hit. Like, I could still see the fireball. And um, so, needless to say, that was quite a day. And by the time I got home, um, uh, it was the end. You know, I didn't get home until like five o'clock. And and something about that triggered in me this sort of need to to 
kind of go deeply into questioning what the hell was going on. And, um, uh, and I didn't have a job, so I had no like immediate responsibility. And I, the truth is I started reading books and learning about stuff that I had no idea about. And I, I discovered um, the environmental crisis. I discovered system science. Uh, I thought much more deeply about how economics and political economy work. And I kind of concluded that our modern capitalist system, with all of its great advantages, and finance that drives the modern capitalist system, was really the root cause of all of these interconnected crises that even you could connect something like 9-11 to. Um, now, you may or may not agree with that, and I'll try to kind of walk you through some of my logic, but um, it kind of shifted me into an entirely new second half of my career uh, direction. And, and, um, and now that's what I do. Um, it's now an industry. There is an industry about the next phase of economics or the next stage of capitalism. Um, George Soros started something called Institute for New Economic Thinking, which has hundreds of millions of dollars behind it, um, questioning the future of economics. And there's conferences all around the world. Um, and what I would say is, just to be really clear, I'm not here to talk about politics or liberal versus conservative ideology. Um, what I believe and what I've uh, come to, to work on sits above a, a left-right split. And, and whenever we talk about economics and politics, we instantly size people up and you know, you're either here or you're there, and I'm with you or I'm against you. So I'm going to ask you to try to suspend that judgment. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I believe, is true, as true if your predilections are to be socialist, communist, or libertarian, uh, Ayn Rand, you know, free market. Um, they have nothing to do with that, and I know that's going to be hard to accept, but just try to hold that as we, as we go through this. Um, and that's what's actually both exciting about it and also um, quite startling is that this isn't simply the classic left-right um, debate. So let's get going. Um, you guys will remember that a few years ago, a French economist, Thomas Piketty, wrote a book called Capital. It's about this thick. Um, it sold millions of copies, New York Times bestseller. And you know, who would ever guess that a dense economics book filled with data would be a bestseller? And how many people have it in their house? How many people have read it? <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't think that many people bought it, read it, myself included. I did, I did skim through it. But the fact that that book made such a splash tells you that we're in a whole new place in questioning economics. And, and the core idea behind Piketty's book was that um, when, it, when economies develop, when countries get richer, um, the rich get richer rather than uh, what used to be the, 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 the underlying assumption, which is that as, as economies develop for a while, the rich get richer, and then it turns the other way, and everyone benefits. And that was, of course, the story between the Great Depression and the 1970s, all the way up to 1980, is that you know, the rich got richer initially, and then there was this crash, and then we had this you know, incredible boom period where a rising tide did lift all boats. But it turns out that was more an aberration. And if you look at the data, the data tells you pretty clearly that, that you know, in the modern capitalist system, it turns out the wealthy get wealthier. And anyone who's worked on Wall Street would say, duh. <laughs> uh, why is that such an amazing realization? But um, that kind of shows you something about the economic profession, is that they were in this denial that, you know, that the whole thing would work out well. So we have an economic system that, um, is, is, is designed, I would argue, to perpetuate increasing wealth inequality. Hold that uh, on the side for a second. There's another problem, which is the ecological crises, multiple crises. And this gets into the whole climate change debate, but many more. And this chart is probably the simplest way to quickly summarize that it's not just about climate. Um, this is you know, peer-reviewed science. Sustainable Development Goals that have been published recently. And essentially it shows the nine core planetary boundaries, they're called, uh, uh, on where we are as a, as a civilization 
with respect to these critical ecological systems. And, and again, the, these are you know, incredibly peer-reviewed, accepted sciences. It's not theory or conjecture. Um, the details on it can be debated, but you see this, the nitrogen cycle, that's the issue where all of the nitrogen in our fertilizers goes into the rivers, and at the base of every river, of every major river on the planet, there's a massive dead zone um, uh, because there's too much uh, nitrogen in the water. You can say, well, what does that have to do with humans? Well, if you understand that everything in a complex system is connected to everything, just like it turns out subprime mortgages in the United States was connected to the global economy, um, then you understand that that's actually a profound and uh, important issue. Climate change, you see, and, and the idea here is that when the, when the red exceeds the green, we're outside the boundary. Climate change is obviously the one that many of us are now focused on. Uh, we have exceeded the boundary. We're at 402, I think, parts per million of, of carbon in the atmosphere. The, the scientific consensus is we should be at 150. All of the two degree warming you hear about in the Paris Agreement is not actually 150. It's, it's, uh, so in other words, 150 is lower than two degrees. It's really one and a half degrees that, um, uh, sorry, 350, uh, one and a half degrees is what, what most of the experts say is the highest we should be uh, striving for, and we're already past it, and there's a whole lot of carbon already baked in. So I don't want to get us into a doom and gloom about climate change, but um, I'm sure most of you are, are paying close attention to that, but it's a um, profoundly serious um, uh, reality that we need to deal with. Uh, but as if that's not the only problem, um, this one over here, biodiversity loss, if you, if you really want to get yourself depressed, go to a biodiversity conference. Uh, the experts, the scientists in biodiversity will explain that we're in the sixth great extinction. And the last great extinction was when the meteorite hit and wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, I'm not qualified to explain how and when and if this is going to hurt us in this room. Um, but the takeaway from this is that this is not simply we need to switch our energy system to renewable energy. We have an economic system that's breaching multiple boundaries of the biosphere, and they're all connected in ways that we probably don't really fully understand. And so, in, in my opinion, um, we need to rethink the fundamental design of how we live and operate on this planet, and we need to do it now. And, this, and there's already symptoms, all the problems we're reading about from droughts, you know, the, 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 um, the problem in Syria, the root cause of the problem in Syria is droughts in the countryside, which means the tribes move to the cities where they're not welcome and people start fighting. So climate change is causing the Syrian uh, crisis. That's, that's now relatively accepted. Certainly, certainly has a major influence. I'll probably point to one single cause. Um, so again, this is the bummer part of this talk, um, but I think it's important to kind of lay out some facts, what I believe are facts, and, and, um, and again, my conclusion after studying this for years and thinking about it deeply is that the root cause is really the economic system design, and this is again nothing to do with do you believe in socialism or capitalism or communism or anyism. It has to do with a finite planet and an exponentially growing economy that has an impact on the biosphere. And how bad is it? Well, if you think about the refugee crisis as a symptom or as a leading indicator of a collapse, um, the data is pretty frightening. And um, uh, you know, most of the people that are being forced to move, um, whether it's for political reasons, war, warfare, or directly related to climate, uh, climate is, is somehow linked into that. Um, and and the, the, the rate of change of this problem, and, you know, we don't feel it as much here in the United States, but, you know, you go to Europe and this is, this is the deal, and it's, um, it's, it's really quite, quite uh, extraordinary. Um, now, to put all this in kind of a long-term context, um, how many people are familiar with this idea of the Anthropocene? The Anthropocene, if I can pronounce that correctly. Many people. Often when I ask that question, no one has ever heard of it. Back in 2011, The Economist ran this cover story saying, welcome to the Anthropocene. And there's two scientists, one a Nobel Prize winning chemist, who coined this term and, and asserted, um, and this is his, you know, two, two people's opinion, but they're very respected scientists, 
they asserted that we've actually entered into a new ecological era. After 10,000 years of relatively stable Holocene, 10,000 years, right? Like 10,000 years, we now have entered a new ecological era. And the economist writes an article saying, isn't this cool? We're in charge. Without really, you know, getting a handle on, this is like once in the history of modern, not even modern civilization, even once in the history of humanity for all practical purposes. And no one's even talking about it. In fact, most audiences have never heard of it. Um, and, 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 and so this is not just another economic cycle. This is way bigger than that. On top of that, I think it's, you know, so that's the macro. At a, at a, at a smaller scale, um, I'm going to propose what's happening is we've entered into a, a new era of, of, of sort of modern Western civilization, the prior ones being the medieval era, where essentially, um, you know, the church was sort of set the, set the rules and the, and the pope sort of had this direct line to God and set out the, you know, Scripture says, do this, and if you do this and this and this, you'll go to heaven. If you do that, you'll go to hell. Um, and that worked pretty well for, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, and then this guy called Copernicus comes along and says, you know, in fact, he didn't say this until he was almost dead because he was so afraid. But his theory was that the Earth actually uh, is not the center of the universe. The Earth is rotating around the sun, which is a profound difference. Now, all of the, the Pope and the, all of the, the scholars around the Pope didn't really like this idea because if the Earth's not the center of the universe, then, if, then, then the whole idea that the church is at the top of the human civilization and the Pope has this direct line to God and it's all centered around that, you know, if you call into question and the Earth is just one of many planets circling, so then, you know, why do we listen to the Pope? Because we're just one planet of many. And so the, the, the scholars around the church at the time um, essentially um, put a kibosh on this idea. And the point being is that when you shift eras, in this case, the introduction of the scientific revolution, it's very threatening to the people in power. And I think we're going through a similar shift today, having spent uh, 400 years, roughly, in the age, in the modern age, with all of its great advances, we're kind of coming to the natural limits of that thinking. And there's a whole new kind of thinking happening. And there's a reason why Google and Facebook are worth billions of dollars, because they're part of this shift. Um, and, and people are not calling this the integral age. But just going back to, to, to the medieval times, so Pope Paul here in his red power robe, um, uh, there was an inquisition against Galileo. Galileo, by the way, uh, figured out, proved with his telescope what Copernicus had, had theorized. And he lived an uncomfortable life in, in house arrest uh, and was instructed to abandon completely the opinion that the sun stands still at the center of the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those of us who are today questioning the power structure, which I would argue is represented by this guy, um, and I'm not really picking on Pope Alan Greenspan, um, but he is obviously representative of the Church of Economics. Um, and, and we bow down to the Church of Economics whether we want to, mean to, or realize it. Uh, we organize our lives, we organize our communities, we organize our jobs around the idea that it needs to be economic um, and that economics is sort of the guiding philosophy of, of at least Western uh, society. Now, um, it's interesting, the, um, uh, there's a gentleman here who, who was involved with Long-Term Capital, which I was involved in back in, uh, in the 90s. And, and Long-Term Capital blew up in 1998 for the same reason, essentially, that the financial crisis in 2008 happened. Um, and so the, the, you know, the geniuses um, chose not to understand the real lesson of Long-Term Capital and waited for us to really do it in a big way in, in 2008. But in 2008, um, even Pope Allen acknowledged that the whole intellectual edifice of our modern financial system collapsed last summer, meaning the summer, when, uh, summer of 2008. And, and people like Alan Greenspan, and I truly am not picking on him because he's just, you know, he was sort of at the pinnacle of, of the economics field, um, are still uh, relatively um, in, in, a, in a sort of soul-searching funk about what did we get wrong and why did this happen and why we couldn't predict it. 
Um, and, and I would argue they're sort of trapped in a paper bag of their own making because I believe that economics is actually built on, on a faulty foundation in ways that, that are astonishing. Then there's this guy, Pope Francis. Note, by the way, I don't know how to make this go backwards, but note that Alan wears a red tie, um, the power tie again. Um, Pope Francis totally gets it. And if you want to read a document, and I'm not Catholic, this is not about you know, religion at all, or one religion versus another, um, but he wrote something called the encyclical, um, I guess it's two years ago now, and in it, one of his uh, important sentences is, we urgently need a humanism capable of bringing together the different fields of knowledge, including economics, in the service of a more integral and integrated vision. And so the idea here is that the, mod the scientific revolution was largely about the idea of reductionist thinking. Take something that's very complicated, break it down into its parts that you can understand, and then that's how we make progress. That makes total sense. And, and no one's suggesting we give up the reductionist method. But it turns out that when you separate complex problems into their little parts and don't bring it back together and understand and keep track of the whole, you get yourself into serious trouble. So, you know, modern advances uh, using uh, petrochemicals and petroleum energy was wonderful for lots of reasons, but we separated all of that from an understanding that you can't put too much carbon in the atmosphere or you'll have all these negative consequences. So now we're dealing with what's really a symptom of reductionist thinking. Same in finance. Um, you know, I was a derivative specialist in the 80s and early 90s, and we prided ourselves in breaking down complex risk into the different buckets and managing the interest rate risk here and the foreign exchange risk there and the commodity risk over there. And it turns out that these things are actually all still linked together. So when we have a subprime crisis in the United States, as I mentioned earlier, um, it has feedback loops into the entire system in ways that no one could possibly have, have expected in advance. And, and amazingly, Pope Francis, of all people, it's the Pope who first separated the church from the scientific community, is now the one calling for a reintegration of uh, religion and, and, and modern science, which is science that understands that everything is connected to everything. Now, right about the time that he wrote the encyclical, I put out my, um, you know, I haven't written a book yet, but this is the closest thing I have to a book, and it, it will be a book someday, but I, I put out a paper called Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape Our Next Economy. And that's become really the touchstone for my work at Capital Institute, and, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. It's, it's theoretical, and most people uh, have a limited uh, patience with theory. And, um, and I, I understand that. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an academic. I'm not a theoretical person normally. Um, but I would suggest that when we're running global human civilization, on an economic system that's fundamentally fatally flawed, based on flawed theory, it's time to pause and give some serious thought, rethinking to, to theory. And, um, and Einstein said, uh, theories determine what we're able to see. So what I interpret that to mean is that, yes, if you, wanted, if you have a new idea, build it and demonstrate it with a living project. So seeing is believing. But also we need to understand that the theories that influence our thinking uh, limit what we can see. So not only is seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. So if we believe something, then we see the world through a lens that determines what we believe. And I think we're trapped in that, in that problem now. And, and at the heart of our current theory is the idea that economic growth is the path to prosperity. Right? So we always talk about economic growth. And the left and the right argue and fight about how to generate economic growth. Um, but we never question whether economic growth alone is actually the path to prosperity. Even the guy that invented the GNP growth indicator, a Nobel Prize winning economist back in 1971, said at the time that you can scarcely tell the welfare of a nation based on the national income accounts. So obviously, you know, if you, if you drive home tonight and God forbid get in a car accident, uh, and the ambulance comes and takes you to the hospital and the doctor and the surgeon operates on you, that's all economic growth. But that certainly isn't leading to certainly your well-being, much less society's well-being. And there's a zillion examples like that. 
So obviously, we need something more sophisticated than purely economic growth, and yet economic growth is what we cheer when the stock market goes up and what we frown when, when it doesn't happen. Um, at a more basic level, uh, and this may be hard to read, so I'll, I'll read it, but at a more basic level, we have this idea that there's this invisible hand going, dating way back to Adam Smith. And, and what this says here is corporate leaders gather in a field outside Darien, Connecticut, where one of them claims to have seen the invisible hand in the marketplace. <laughs> now, it's funny, but it's true. You know, we, we actually believe there's this invisible hand in the marketplace. And so, as long as we have a market solution, then everything will work out fine. And, you know, I'm a huge proponent of markets. They're wonderful tools for certain things. Um, a spoon is a wonderful tool to eat soup with. But it's not such a wonderful tool to cut a steak with. So we need different tools for different problems. And, and markets on themselves uh, aren't going to solve all these problems. And, you know, you only, you know the, the, the biggest market failure that I'm aware of, obviously, is climate change, where um, uh, markets don't factor in very long-term things that they can't price or see or, or understand. So um, we, we, we generally, I believe, are in the process of having to rethink, relearn how we think. Uh, and this isn't just my idea. This is already happening. So for example, in, in medicine, the, the Western medical paradigm is disease care. If you've got liver cancer, you go to the liver cancer specialist. If you have a broken arm, you go to the arm guy. If you have um, you know, an endocrine system, you go to an endocrinologist. And again, that's all very good. We have specialties that understand all these different parts of our body. Um, but if you want to be healthy, you actually have to invest in your immune system, which we now have a field called integrated medicine, which is all about understanding how to make your immune system healthy because we all have cancer in our body. We all have all these things. And, and we're only healthy because our immune system is actually functioning. Um, in education, We've put education into all of these silos. And we're all now experts at this, that, and the other thing, which, of course, is important. And yet now, in most of the leading universities, um, I don't know most, many leading universities, the current trend is to try to do what, what they call transdisciplinary education, because they recognize that the real breakthroughs are going to happen at the, at, the, at the edges between these different disciplines. Um, same thing happening in finance. Shareholder value is kind of the mantra that those of us in finance live by. You know, you just try to figure out what, to, what will enhance shareholder value, meaning cause the stock price to go up. Um, there's now a whole movement toward what, what we're calling integrated value, which is to take into account factors other than shareholders, the other stakeholders, the employees, the environment, the community that the company works in. And that's a, another expression of this more holistic or network approach to understanding, um, uh, in this case, value, corporate value. And, then, and there are business models. Um, you know, Walmart is kind of the, the consummate reductionist, power, you know, efficiency-driven business model. Um, Amazon, I would argue, even though it's a very modern business, is, is pursuing a very power-driven, reductionist, winner-take-all strategy. Very different than this Chinese company, Alibaba, who um, probably most people aren't that familiar with, but they essentially are a platform company that are enabling millions of small businesses to engage in, in, in uh, internet commerce, uh, mostly in China, but extending beyond China. But they see their role as being an enabler uh, in the same way that an oak tree in a forest is not trying to take all of the nutrients in the forest. The oak tree is actually an enabler of life in the forest. And the oak tree does just fine. Um, and Alibaba, trust me, is doing just fine. So the idea of, of economics um, in this new integral age really rests on a really simple hypothesis, which is the one that I and, and many colleagues are, are, are working with. And that idea is that um, if the human economy is going to be sustainable over a long period of time, not this year, next year, not the next five, ten years, I'm talking indefinitely into the future, then Either it starts behaving like other systems that we know a lot about, living systems in particular, or someone needs to make the case that the human economy is the exception to the rule that all systems that, that last long periods of time tend to follow similar patterns and principles. I don't know if I said that clearly. In other words, an ecosystem, my body, is a living system. We understand how my body works, your body works. We understand how ecosystems work. 
um, we can describe them in patterns and principles. Why is it that the human economy can operate in conflict with those patterns and principles if those principles and patterns show up continuously in all other living systems that have sustained themselves for a long period of time? So the hypothesis is that it can't and that we need to shift our economies to be in alignment with those patterns and principles. So we're getting into a little bit of the heaviness. We'll get out of this soon, I promise. Um, so a quick definition, a regenerative, regenerative economics is the application of nature's laws and patterns of systemic health, self-renewal, and regenerative vitality to socioeconomic systems. Now again, going back to our bodies, um, we live in, a, in what the scientists call far from equilibrium condition. You know, we're not supposed to be able to stand here, breathe, talk, and everything. If we were in equilibrium, we would be dead and everything would be still and dust to dust. But we live in this place where we, we fight all these laws of entry because our body is doing all these amazing, magical, miracle things to keep us alive. And yet economics is based on the idea that we would move toward an equilibrium state. And it turns out that equilibrium state never, never quite happens and we have crisis after crisis. So the idea is that an economy needs to actually learn how to operate the way living systems do. Now, and this is the worst slide, I promise, but, but, um, but there actually is real science behind this. I'm not a scientist, but I have science advisors who I've learned this from, and it turns out that, you know, Einstein figured out everything is energy, E equals mc squared. So there are laws, there are energy laws that work their way up through everything, literally in the cosmos. Um, and so things like systems don't change until there's pressure and then they change in response to the pressure. Does that sound like what's happening right now? Um, so I think of you know, the, the, you know, what's happening in our politics, both the, the, you know, on the, the, the left and the right, uh, what's happening in, um, uh, you know, what happened on 9-11, what's happening in, in terrorism today, as symptoms of us as a civilization responding to pressure. That's following the laws of energy. Um, uh, at, if you move up the um, sort of the complexity from energy and matter, meaning non-living um, uh, things, to living systems, there are other laws, and I'll talk about them in a second. And then, of course, human living systems are kind of an advanced version of living systems. And, the, and these laws even continue all the way up into consciousness. The people that are experts at consciousness talk about it as energy flow. Um, so the idea is that there are universal patterns and principles that, um, that we can understand and identify and then contrast them with how human economies work. And if we do that, um, we will find that we can move from our current degenerative state over on the left, which is rooted in our reductionist thinking, where we think of, different thing, we think of parts, um, and we'll, we'll not just sort of become more sustainable. Um, you know, you don't want a sustainable marriage, right? <laughs> Um, you want a great marriage, and if you have a dynamic living relationship with your spouse um, that's regenerative, it will sustain itself. So the idea that we can sort of um, green our way to sustainability, I, I think, is, is a complete misnomer. And we need to understand that whether it's a, an individual body, a family, a community, uh, a bioregion, a nation, a company, um, all of those will become sustainable only if they adapt this regenerative process. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But that, at, at a conceptual level, means holistic thinking rather than reductionist thinking. Uh, it means seeing and working in patterns um, rather than in parts. Um, you know the old expression, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? Well, obviously that's true, think about your own self. Uh, I would argue that's true at, of a family, true of a community, true of an economy. Um, so you need to think in holistic uh, thinking. And interestingly, um, that, that's often, A, it's very difficult to do. And interestingly, the guy who coined the term holism, this, holism, this isn't like, I don't mean like some California new age thing, <laughs> right? Holism is a scientific idea. Um, the man that coined the term, uh, Jan Smuts, was the Boer War general for South Africa. We have a military historian here, who probably will correct me if I misspeak. Um, uh, Jan Smuts was a, a military strategist, and he, he coined the term holism, and he defined it as the universal principle 
that explains matter, life, and spirit. And he wrote this book that's this thick, kind of in between wars, before he became uh, the, general, or the, the prime minister of South Africa. And the work never, I, in my opinion, I don't know if this is true, but very few people talk about it um, because of South Africa's uh, racial complexity, let's call it. Um, but this man was a genius, and it turns out many military um, uh, experts were holistic thinkers. There's a great quote from um, Eisenhower, where someone said to him, you know, General Eisenhower, what do you do if you find a problem that you can't solve? And he was known as a great military strategist. And he said, oh, that's easy. I make the problem bigger. So reductionist thinking tries to make problems smaller, and then you get whiplash by unintended consequences. Holistic thinking says, no, you've got to get your head around a bigger problem. And, and, um, and of course, uh, military strategy is one where you need to think holistically, because as soon as you set your plan, things change. And, and you have, uh, it's, a comp it's the ultimate complex uh, engagement and things change so you need to be able to un anticipate and adapt to them in real time as opposed to having a, a rigid plan and, and sticking to your plan you could wait to lose the war. So anyway, getting back to, the, to, to this, the, the idea is that we, we need to shift from this degenerative state to a regenerative state and that's happening in, for example, in, in, um, in agriculture. There is a thing called regenerative agriculture and it's very easy to see if it's working because it causes you to build soil rather than destroy soil. Um, I got involved in, in, or I first learned about this through the, the, the project you mentioned, um, uh, this company called Grasslands, where a man named Alan Savory over the last 40 years has developed an ability to manage cattle holistically in accordance with a um, holistic plan that uh, essentially mimics the way the buffalo used to roam. And, and I really, literally got this idea from um, the thinking that, well, if we can learn to manage, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of ranch land holistically, that's a system. Um, what would it look like if we learned to manage economies holistically? And that's what got me onto this whole thing. So my investment activities are actually the source of a lot of my, my thinking and, and learning on this. And in the, in the paper I wrote um, that I referred to earlier, I came up with eight principles um, and I don't have time, and nor do you have the patience for me to kind of drill into each, each here today. Um, but these are them, and they're in the paper if you, if you want to learn more about them. I'll quickly just say, so in, in right relationship, meaning um, uh, everything uh, in healthy living systems works symbiotically, the parts work symbiotic, symbiotically with the other parts. They don't fight with the other parts. Um, uh, the, the, a system is innovative and adoptive and responsive. You know, Darwin's, uh, well, first of all, he didn't coin the term survival of the fittest. He used it. It was, um, I forget the other gentleman's name, Spencer. Um, but what, what Darwin meant by it when he used it was that a, 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 a species will survive when it adapts to its context, its environment, and so it fits best within its environment, like a puzzle piece that fits best within a puzzle. It had nothing to do with, you know, survival of the fittest the way we think of it today and the way modern capitalist ideology has, has stolen that term. It's, it's literally the idea to adapt and adjust. And so, of course, entrepreneurs are very much in alignment with this. They're adapting and, and, and adjusting to a changing context. Um, in systems, uh, all of the parts are empowered to participate in the health of the system. So again, going back to your body, your toes are empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen. If they weren't, your toes would fall off, you couldn't walk, you'd become obese, you'd get sick, you wouldn't be healthy. So the whole debate about inequality looked at through a systems lens could be understood as, well, wait a second, if half the planet is not empowered to participate in the health of the system, then the whole system can't be healthy. Um, so it, you kind of get away from a moral debate and into a how does a healthy system work? It actually shows us that if we don't um, develop policies that empower all participants in the system to participate in the system, both to, to have their needs met and to contribute to the system, then the whole system can't be healthy. And of course, what's happening in, in Charlottesville this weekend is evidence of what happens if we don't do this. Um, community in place, you know, I think we all have this innate sense that uh, community and place is important. Stonington's very different than San Francisco or, or wherever. 
And, um, and it turns out in living systems, they're all unique and in the context of their place. Edge effect is another ecological idea. It, it turns out that life happens at edges of system. That's where exchanges happen. So where a river meets uh, Long Island Sound, there's marshes, and that they're rich with uh, diversity of life. They're also dangerous. The ospreys hang out at the edge, um, and that's where they get their food. Um, but in a dynamic system, um, life happens at the edges. Uh, you can think of a, of a healthy living system, the metaphor would be metabolism. Um, if, 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 if money, if materials, if information is not flowing in, in an economy across all scales in a healthy way, the system can't be healthy, just like if you're not metabolizing in your body, you can't be healthy. It also requires uh, that you invest in the system. You know, you have to eat healthy food to be a healthy human being. Well, if you think about the austerity move in Europe in response to the financial crisis, you know, you're essentially starving a system that's already struggling. Um, it'd be like being sick and, and withholding healthy food from a human being. Um, there has to be a way to invest in a system, particularly when it's unhealthy. And then balance is, is you know, there's lots of examples of balance. The one I'd like to throw out um, and, and talk in particular, though, is that it turns out from, um, you know, empirical studying of living systems, they balance uh, what I would call efficiency with resiliency. So modern economics is all about the pursuit of efficiency. But it turns out in living systems that they build in redundancy and diversity so that they're more resilient. And by being more resilient, they actually sacrifice some efficiency. And yet our entire economics is about the pursuit of efficiency. So you wonder, you know, the, the, you, could, you could trace the financial crisis again to the pursuit of efficiency in terms of return on capital, um, but at the expense of a resilient system. Another way to think about this resiliency efficiency thing is, is the fractal nature of, of systems. You know, we have big veins, we have middle size, uh, we have big arteries, middle sized veins, and lots of capillaries to move oxygen and blood around our body. Um, that's what a river system looks like, that's what an ecosystem looks like. So maybe that's the way we should think about structuring our banking system uh, with, with a few big banks, lots of medium sized banks, and lots and lots of little banks. Of course, what's what's happening in our current system is moving it in the opposite direction. These fractal patterns are, are found all throughout nature, um, both living and non-living. Um, and, and we could spend a lot of time on that, but I want to uh, keep moving. And, and this understanding of fractal patterns, pa fractal patterns mean that the pattern repeats across scales. So, you know, like going back, um, uh, if you think about a tree, I don't have a picture of a tree here, but if you think about a tree, you have these, you know, you have the massive trunk, you have big branches, you have smaller branches, and you have little branches and leaves, and that pattern repeats out into the leaves. It also repeats underground in the root system. Um, that's a fractal pattern repeating it across scales. Um, it turns out that one of the mathematical geniuses of our time, uh, this guy, Benoit Menebrot, applied fractal thinking to financial markets. And some of the, um, some of the more sophisticated uh, uh, financial traders look at patterns in markets using these same fractal geometry. Um, so, so understanding these patterns, is, it turns out you know, they, they apply everywhere. And, and I would argue that the, um, the, eight pattern, the eight principles that I described earlier, I think of those as this fractal pattern that if we have a healthy economy, will operate at small scales, like a community economy, at a bioregional economy, at a national economy, and ultimately even at a global economy, because those patterns are what show up in, in living systems that we study. And I mentioned uh, the first one of those is right relationship and that, this idea of holism. Um, uh, and, and, and central to the idea of holism is that there are holes that are embedded in larger holes, like um, you know, a Russian doll. And I think what's you know, at the root cause of our problem is our financial system. Um, and our financial system sort of looks at the world like this. Um, and I'm an investor, so I'm guilty of this. I'm, this is not meant to be, you know, wagging my finger at anyone. This is just the way we work. Um, you know, and in, a, a financial um, uh, person looks at an economy and looks to invest capital in such a way to optimize risk of re adjusted return. And so we build a building, we build a company, we do whatever through this metric of, you know, is this a good use of capital? Does it generate a good return on capital? 
And the economy then essentially sucks resources out of the planet, natural resources and human resources, and, and spins those into uh, business enterprises in such a way to optimize the return on capital. And when capital is not being um, treated that way, uh, new capital comes in, whether it's a hostile takeover or an activist shareholder, or the business goes out of business. Um, so it's all organized around the pursuit of, of, of economic efficiency. And of course, if you actually think about an economy and what finance should do, um, this is like entirely backwards. And, and we really should have a financial system in service of an economy that understands that the economy is embedded in the planet and is embedded in you know, human society. And that, it, that it's a human society first and a human economy first and that, and that the dog, the tail wagging the door, dog shouldn't be financed. And I'm a finance guy. Um, so, you know, I had sort of this epiphany that, you know, all these smart young whippersnappers like me are actually the root cause of all of these other problems. Now, that doesn't mean that finance people are bad, but it does mean that, uh, in my opinion, that our, our, our finance-driven ideology is in conflict with a proper holistic understanding of how uh, how an economy actually has to work. Now, put that aside. That's kind of the, the big ideas here. So what does that mean kind of like in, in, in our lives, day to day, on the ground? Um, one of the things we do at Capital Institute is we do a lot of storytelling. Um, because, as I said earlier, most people don't have any patience for the theory. Um, there, there is, I hope I gave you at least a, a glimmer that there's actually real theory behind uh, the work we're doing. Uh, and we're actually working on measures so we can actually measure regenerative health, um, just like you go to the doctor and they measure your blood pressure that tells you a lot about your intrinsic health. Um, but we're trying to put these ideas to work on the ground and, and, and we're trying to illuminate projects that are happening all around the world where these ideas are actually already happening. And, and, and what's exciting to me is that I believe in response to the pressures that we are experiencing, the regenerative economy is happening. Uh, the system scientists call it an, an emergent phenomenon, meaning it emerges in response to the pressures. And there's probably 40 different projects that tend to be small scale that, um, that you can read about on our website at Capital Institute if you're interested. One of them is this place, Cottonville, which is on the southern half of Staten Island. It's, it's very much Trump country, forgotten, you know, neglected, um, uh, low middle income communities really in economic dire straits. And, um, and we're working in that community to try to um, cultivate some, some uh, or, or sort of light some, light some fuses um, to find you know, the, uh, the unmet needs that exist in those communities and the assets, the underutilized assets, and get them working together. Um, and, um, and I think this is going to happen and is happening all around the world, including here in Stonington. I mean, Stonington obviously is not by any means you know, a struggling community. Um, so the pressures aren't that great here, and yet the pressures are here. Um, and, and I think there are, um, you know, if you think about this bioregion, say from New London up to Providence, or however you want to draw it, there's no right or wrong way to think about it, um, there's lots of tension and pressure. And, um, uh, and we could think about what a regenerative economy in this bioregion would look like and how we would get started uh, doing it. And then, you know, I always like to say sustainability, the, the, the ground zero for sustainability is food. Um, and, and not just because we need to eat healthy food uh, and getting the toxins out of our food, meaning organic, meaning not poisonous, is, in, is essential, but just the beginning. Um, it turns out if you, actually I, I should have mentioned this earlier, there's a great new study out called Drawdown. Um, it was written by, or, or it was a research project over many years, several years, led by Paul Hawken. And uh, drawdown refers to drawing down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And uh, it goes through, I think, 100 solutions to, to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and it's fascinating because most people presume that, well, solar this, wind that, you know, electric cars, we've got to get all that stuff done. And of course, we have to do all that stuff. But what's fascinating about the study is that it shows 100 things we need to do and none of the top ones are the ones I just mentioned. Which is good. Because that means there's other stuff we know we can do that's really, really important. So for example, um, if you took educating women 
and uh, population, basically population control. That's by far the number, you know, if, if, if you hold that as one idea, um, the difference between 9 billion and 10 billion people on this planet multiplied by everyone wanting at least a lower middle class lifestyle, that's by far the single biggest thing we can do. Um, the next biggest single one will surprise you. It's getting the refrigerants out of our air conditioning. You know, years ago we stopped putting ozone, we stopped destroying the ozone, but we started using, uh, H, I think they're called HFCs, um, and those are terrible greenhouse gases. And, and so it's more important that we dispose of those gases correctly than it is that we put solar panels on roofs. Um, and there's, there's, there's international agreements that are leading to that happening already, which is very encouraging. But the one that most people have no idea about is agriculture. Um, some people know about this. But um, the combination of the diets we eat and the way we grow our food and the way we manage the grasslands in particular, but also the way we manage our forests, those all relate to what's called the carbon sink, which is how much carbon is absorbed into the planet and held. So the, you know, the, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is a function of how much we emit minus how much gets absorbed. And the biggest carbon sink is the ocean, and it's overloaded, and that's creating lot, lots of problems. But our agriculture system, our industrial agriculture system, again, is an industrial model of reductionist thinking, throw fertilizers down, turn over the soil, we're, we're eroding the soil, and that's not only bad from the point of view of we need soil to grow our food, but it's also turning this massive carbon sink into a source. And so fixing our food system, both the diets we eat, the food we don't waste, and how we do our agriculture is incredibly important. And of course, right here in, in Stonington, there's a, there's a beautiful new example of this, and Jane is the, the, uh, the fearless leader behind Stonington's farm. And I was really, really, um, uh, really blown away, and I told everyone involved in the project when I read the plan, because the people that have put together this plan understand regenerative systems. This isn't just let's do a farmer's market, or this isn't just let's save an old family farm, which is, it is both of those things too. But the thinking in the plan really um, was to me an example of this regenerative thinking happening, even though I suspect when you all sat around talking about it, you didn't sit there saying, let's do a regenerative farm. Um, but it's happening because it's common sense. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples of that, or I'll give you one example of that that, that, that I was really uh, moved by. And so this picture is the, uh, essentially it used to be the road. It's called the, it's called the Pentway, the Pentway, that essentially runs through the center of, of the farm. That was before there were all the buildings there. This is what it looks like today. And that, and that, that, that road I just showed you is going from the upper right down toward North Main Street. Um, and in a sense, that's the throughway going through the farm. Now, remember one of the principles I mentioned was um, uh, the edge effect, meaning life happens at the edges. Well, there's a not terribly good reproduction of one of the diagrams in Stone Acre's plan. And it shows the pentway going across the middle there. And they've structured the farm to have the, um, the heritage, you know, the old house, uh, uh, and, and obviously that's going to need to be um, uh, restored and revitalized a bit. It's in, in pretty good shape, but essentially preserving the heritage of the history of what was there. That's over in the lower left. In the upper left is where the artisanal work's going to happen. So work's going to happen on the farm making food products. And then on the upper right is essentially where the, um, the, the food will grow. And of course, that's a much bigger quadrant than it, than it appears here. That's most of the farm. And then in the lower right is the marketplace to bring people and communities to be inspired by all this that's happening. Well, what does that create? We've created edges between the heritage, the artisanal, the agrarian, and the marketplace, which I believe will stimulate um, creative juices and new action and new enterprises because that edges, uh, those edges are being mined and, and worked together. It's an example of the edge effect uh, right on one farm. Um, in, in a very exciting way, and I, I was really honored and, and pleased to be able to join, uh, join with you all, and, and it's a, obviously a passion of mine to, uh, to contribute to. Um, and then finally, um, I wanted to share, I, you know, I, 
there's an organization called the Genesis who um, inspired some of the real estate projects that I've been investing in with a, with a partner. Um, and, and we call them re regenerative real estate projects. And essentially, they're about um, uh, a, a, a development plan that's aligned with these same patterns and principles. And, and the, the key, and I didn't say this earlier, but the key is if you get things to work in accordance with these patterns, you tap into potential that you didn't even know existed. And if we had more time, I could give you examples of that on how that worked in these real estate projects. But you, we went from you know, the environmentalists fighting the developers to a project that the environmentalists love, the community love, and the developer um, can actually end up making more money from because we've tapped into this regenerative potential. And so I was so impressed by this group, um, Regenesis, that I actually asked them to come look at Stonington. And, and we did a whole, they, they've got like a 30 slide PowerPoint helping me understand what is Stonington, what is this place, and, and it's fascinating. Um, you know, one of the cool things is that the Pequot were at the cutting edge of currency innovation. And here I'm attracted to this place, and I'm kind of a finance guy, and, and so there's something about Stonington that's good at, at economic um, uh, creativity. But, but again, going back to this idea of fractal patterns, um, they pointed out to me that Long Island Sound is a pattern. And, um, and if you think about it, there's this island, and it's and it's, you know, and there's this essentially big lake in the middle of it, what used to be a lake, and it's now a sand. Um, but if you then drill down, that pattern, and you squish your eyes a little bit and be a little bit, you know, uh, creative, that pattern repeats in Fisher's Island Sound. So there's Long Island and Long Island Sound, and there's Fisher's Island and Fisher's Island Sound, and then it repeats again in Stonington. Again, you've got to squish your eyes even more, but um, Sandy Point is essentially another repeat of that fractal, and the entire Little Narragansett Bay is another um, uh, expression of that pattern repeating itself. And, and then Stonington sits you know, at the edge between Long Island Sound, Fisher's Island Sound, and the Atlantic Ocean. And my whole kind of career was on the other edge of this fractal, Wall Street. And so there's a reason why I was uh, attracted to this place. And in fact, um, I had no idea any of that when we first visited Stonington um, uh, what is it, 20, 25 years ago. Um, so anyway, we're, we're here now, and I hope that the home we built um, will we'll follow these regenerative <coughs> principles. Um, there's something called a living bu building. If you're interested, you can Google that, and you'll find all kinds of details on how to actually build a living building. Um, it, it gets really involved, and so we'll be able to do some variation of that, but that's, um, that's what we're looking forward to do here. So thank you very much. How much time did I open? Okay, good. We have time for some discussion. There's a question right here. Sure. Accepting your thesis, I get the feeling, looking at the world now, that the forces driving us back towards all of the destructive elements are so much greater than the regenerative forces. Yeah. That if, and I don't mean to be a doomsday, but if you had to predict here, just look at our own country as an example now, that these developing degenerative destructive forces have so much momentum yeah. that is there a chance for the constructive regenerative forces to counter and then take over this? If yeah. you, were, you were making an estimate based on your prior financial acumen, trying to understand what markets would do, how would you predict the tipping point here? And are we perhaps doomed? I know that's an awful hard. <laughs> no, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, you know, anyone who is really paying attention needs to be asking that question, I think. Um, because if you sort of logically play this out and, and have, um, any modicum of realist, realism, um, you're going to get depressed. Mm -hmm. um, so here's here's what I here's why I hold hope, and I do. Uh, first of all, we are now living in a world of complexity, and the one thing we know about complexity is you can't make predictions. It's a fool's errand. Who would have predicted the last election? 
Who would have predicted the Berlin Wall coming back? Who would have predicted any of this stuff happening? So I think, I think it's a fool's errand to try to predict what's going to happen. And what, um, what complexity science talk about is, um, is, is working with the system and, and guiding the system as opposed to managing and controlling the system. Um, so that's point one. Point two is that I truly believe that these regenerative patterns, if we can get in alignment with them, um, things will become possible that we can't predict today. Like, the example I like to use is the internet. The internet was invented by Al Gore 30 years ago. <laughs> Who would have predicted Google search? Who would have predicted good and bad social media? So there are going to be things happening that we can't know today, some of which will be scary bad, and some of which will be um, hold tremendous potential to, to make the, the prediction you would want to make today seem more realistic. Um, so so for, I don't know if that makes sense, but for, for me, I try to keep my head on what can we do to move toward a regenerative system, and in a sense, take a leap of faith that we don't happen to live at the time when this whole thing is going to come tumbling down. You know, I mean, I'll be candid. I bought waterfront property knowing that sea level is rising. And I'm, I'm not really that stupid, but I don't believe this whole thing is going to go down in my lifetime and my kids' lifetime. But that's also my statement to, to you know, to, to show myself and my kids that that's what I believe. Let's hope to God you're right. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. But I do think, you know, we, we've had, the, we've gone through the dark ages before. And there's no question that we could enter a new dark age. That's one possibility. But you know what's interesting? In the dark ages, most people lived better than they did under the feudal system before. Think about that. Yeah. John, let's suppose we talk about the shift. Yeah. As we go to the next stage of the internet, or digital, it's all of a sudden not looking at the physical models, but looking at bio, biological, biomedical yeah. models. And you see that developing. In your view of what you're doing with the general comment, how do you see those concepts fitting in what you're doing? And secondly, how do you adapt to the digital, obviously, very differently from the models of the pool in the 20th century, and that's chaos theory. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, so the biological models, um, if you go back to that complicated slide uh, that starts with energy and matter, think of that as physics. Biology sits above that. Um, but then there's, you know, human social sciences sit above that and consciousness above that. And, and ultimately, you know, the difference between my framework um, and, and um, I forgot, there is one more slide here. Jane Jacobs, where's my Jane Jacobs friend? Jane Jacobs was one of my, um, is one of my real teachers. And, um, uh, and, and, um, and Sally Gorner, who's our science advisor, actually influenced Jane Jacobs thinking as well. And, and what Sally reminds us is that this, is, this isn't just biomimicry, um, because this is a human economy. And humans are different than dogs and cats and trees and bugs. And so I actually think that it's way more complex than, a, than simply applying a, a biological model. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, we need to embed in the model human values, um, and, and we could talk a long time about that. So it's, a, it's, it's integrated, inclusive of biological models, but not limited by biological models. Um, with respect to chaos theory, so chaos theory is one branch of complexity science. What Sally would say, don't ask me to explain it. Um, what Sally would say is that it got lost in the math and it lost touch with how living systems work. So um, chaos theory is, is, um, is not what we're doing. I'll just say that. Um, we're, what we're doing is trying to um, uh, understand how real systems in the real world work as opposed to how extreme abstraction and mathematical models might behave absent the real world. Um, and then uh, Schumpeter, so his big idea was um, 
uh, creative destruction, right? So, so yes, we are, we, we are experiencing creative destruction, and, and if you think about um, you know, how systems evolve, is they, you know, the context changes, um, so something changes, there's a new influence in a system, and, and, and the system has to adapt to that, uh, to that change. And so that, that adoption, responsiveness, and creativity is, is essential, or the species goes away. So if we don't adapt, create, evolve, respond, we will go away. Uh, and that to me is entirely aligned with the creative destruction idea. Now what we need to also do is what's getting destroyed, including communities, we need to have a strategy because these are human beings, not just uh, you know, corporations. Um, that we haven't done a very good job of. Super. That was great. That was great. Thank you all for uh, your patience.